Thank you for tuning in to the Bethel Temple Faith Church broadcast. We appreciate your viewership and we're confident that there's a word of God for you today. Now with today's message, our pastor and founder, Pastor Bertram D. Hinton Jr. That gives us access to your throne. Uh, it is prayer that unlocks your mysteries to us and gives us those things that we need to make it. So we thank you for times of prayer, even on tonight and as we now enter into your word. We thank you that the prayers we have prayed have paved the way yes. for the freedom of your word to come forth tonight. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord for your word that will speak health to our navel and marrow yes. to our bones. Yes. Thank you for your word that will take us from this place called here to the place called there. Thank you for the anointing that makes teaching easy and just for your abiding presence being with us tonight. We ask you to hear those that may watch this by way of uh, social media and even those that don't have a desire to come out tonight god we just pray you would be with your people in the totality god bless you, Lord. these moments uh let the ones that did press their way and that are pressing their way understand and know that their press was not in vain this was not just something to do but there is intentional purpose yes. here tonight and when they leave from this place i pray god that they would go rejoicing knowing that they've been in the presence of the living God. So have your way this night. Uh, we pray against any distraction, any hindrance, those things that would attempt to exalt itself against your knowledge. We cast those things down now, and we ask God that the free flow of your spirit and will would be released in this house, oh, that yes. you would get the glory out of our time this night. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for guiding us. But most importantly, thank you for being God. We give you these, we ask these, these things, these prayers in Jesus' Jesus. name. Amen. 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 Romans chapter 8 is where I want to look. It's two verses of scripture in particular that I want to uh, give attention to. Romans chapter 8 and it's verses 24 and 25. Romans chapter 8 uh, verses 24 and 25 is what we want to give attention tonight in the word of the Lord. And I believe that there is... Um, some real revelation that God has for us connected to these verses of scripture. So again, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 24 and 25 will be our area of study tonight. So when you have Romans 8, verse 24, you acknowledge by saying amen. 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 The word of the Lord reads on this wise, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Tonight, I just want to teach from this thought two words, by hope. That's what I want to teach on tonight. By hope, by hope, by hope. All right, Paul uh, pins this letter to the church, um, to the Roman church, if you will, uh, he pens this letter to them uh, having clothed various instructions uh, and in various ways to them about just who God was and how God reacts and how God is. Um, when you started off, when he started off the book in, in Romans, uh, you know, chapter one, he helps us to understand, you know, that our uh, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ we're not supposed to be ashamed of because it's through this gospel uh, that we're capable of going from faith to faith, uh, going to new levels in who God is. And every chapter, Paul continues to build on a central theme, a centralized theme of just the accuracy and the power of who Jesus really is. Up until he gets to this eighth chapter, the book of Romans, and he begins to uh, delve now into our faith, our hope, things that we believe, things that we should be doing. And when he gets to the verse that we're using tonight, he causes attention uh, to really be centered uh, on this one word, hope. Now, uh, this, this, word, this word hope, um, it, it carries definitions that we're familiar with, but tonight I, I'm, I'm trying to deal with or get across to us um, what makes us different from others? That's good. Okay? And, and I'm not talking about other Christians. I'm talking about all Christians today. This is not a, a church-related teaching. This is uh, the kingdom of God. What makes the citizens of the kingdom different 
from the, those that have not professed Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and, and the difference is simply hope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have hope, uh, whereas there are those who do not necessarily know or subscribe to the same teachings and belief as us. Um, we go through problems. We, we go through challenges go like the next man. Um, but the difference in how we go through is we, we should have hope. You know, when, when tragic things happen in the life of the believer, yes, uh, the response, Sister Kira, is, is only different because of the hope that lives in me. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. not that I don't feel pain. It, it's not that I don't get frustrated. It's right. not that I'm not bothered when things happen. The, the only difference is my response is still clothed in hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that there is some good that's going to come out of this bad to make me a better person mm -hmm. and to make me stronger in my faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that we, we got a magic wand, D, mm -hmm. that, that says when we go through stuff, it doesn't get under our skin. It's not, Sister Grant, that we got this thing that happens where, you know, uh, we, we, we walk around on cloud nine all the time. No, the difference is only because we've got hope. Mm -hmm. That word hope, that word hope is defined in the English definition. Hope means one in the verb tense. It means to cherish a desire with anticipation. To cherish a desire with anticipation. Hope is further defined as the expectation of fulfillment or attainment of a certain thing. The expectation of fulfillment, fulfillment or obtainment of a certain thing. Hope also, it means simply to want something to happen. Mm -hmm. So means I want something to happen. Hope. So again, it's to cherish a desire with anticipation. It is the expectation of fulfillment or obtainment of a certain thing. Or to simply want something to happen. Right. In the noun sense, the word hope, it means trust. But also means to expect with confidence. Mm -hmm. To trust. To expect with confidence. Now, when when we... Uh, well, let's do this. The Greek word, the Greek in the, New, in the New Testament, the Greek word for, for hope is elpis. Elpis is E-L-P-I-S. Elpis. E-L-P-I-S. Elpis is simply defined as hope, but it, it is a confident expectation of good. Help us, the confident expectation of good. Now, we, we said earlier that, that we it's not that we don't go through various things in life. It's not that we don't uh, experience things that would set us back or things that would slow us up. The, the, the thing that we have in the midst of all of our trials is there is th still supposed to be a confident expectation of good. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. That, that even though I'm going through this, the sickness is real. The pain is real. That's right. The oppression is real. The depression is real. The injury is real. The hurt is real. But in the face of all of these things, mm -hmm. there's still something churning on the inside yeah. of me yes. that is confident that there will be good yeah. to come out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to take my time with it because I, I, I'm getting excited already, but I want to I want to make sure I walk this thing through, Shell, because the thing I want us to catch tonight is not just the excitement the pastor has, but I want us to get excited. Yeah. yeah. To understand that no matter what it is we face, Sister Jackson, there is always a glimmer of hope in me. That's it. Yeah. There is a glimmer that there has to be something good that came out of me being rejected for this job. Yeah. It's got to be something good that came out of me having to spend time in a hospital. Yeah. It's got to be something good that came out of this rockiness in my marriage. Mm -hmm. Hope is the glimmer in me Hope. that says it still got to be something good. Because if I continue to read in this 8th chapter of Romans, I get to the 28th verse that we love to quote and share. And we know that all things mm -hmm. work together for good. So then we are called according to the love of God. And then we are called according to his purpose. Yeah. So whenever I am who I say I am, 
there has to be, somebody say has to be, has to be. an expectation of good. Mm. Which means even when your child is sick, it's okay to cry. It's okay to, to seek doctors. It's okay to do all those things. But in the middle of it, yes, sir. there still has to be mm -hmm. an expectation of good. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what separates me from the world. Mm -hmm. That's what stops me from popping pills when my troubles come. Go ahead. Yeah. That's what stops me from slitting my wrist yeah. when frustration comes. Right. Because there's a glimmer of hope yes, in sir. me. There's something that's working in me that has an expectation of good. Mm. All right, let's go this route because I really feel my help right here. So, Minister Black, I yes, do sir. this periodically. Uh, when the Lord speaks to me, Minister Williamson, when he speaks to me, sometimes he'll speak to me in songs. And, and I don't necessarily fully understand the, the gist of it because while I do have some, um, some, let me see, I can say this and not be offensive. Uh, I'll just, I won't say it. I do have some knowledge of hymns and things of that magnitude. However, uh, I may not necessarily know all the verses. So, 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 the, the, uh, Minister Black, I began yes, today uh, when I was doing this study on hope. The song came to me. Uh, William said uh, that, that, and it's actually titled, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, 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 so I, I began to really uh, look at the verses uh, of this particular song. Now, now, this song uh, I had to write down so I didn't forget was written by a man by the name of Edward Mote, M O T E. Uh, he wrote it back in 1834, mm. Minister Black. So he wrote yes, it some years before any of us ever existed. Yes, sir. Uh, and and listen, listen to what he, he writes in the verse. Now, now we all know the beginning. My hope is none other than Jesus' blood and righteous. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'm not going to give you the refrain yet, but listen to listen to these next three verses. He says, "When darkness veils His lovely face." I rest on his unchanging grace. Yeah. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Mm. The third verse says, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Fourth, when he shall come appear with trumpet sound, oh, I, oh may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. The refrain, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now here, here's what I want us to catch. The, the depth of this man's revelation of mm. what I'm going to try to teach y'all tonight. He, he says, my, my, my hope is built, but it's times when darkness right. will cover his lovely face. Wow. He says, but in those moments mm -hmm. is when I learn how to rest on his unchanging grace. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what I want to catch. I want to catch this. So when hope tells me to quit, mm -hmm. that's when I have to rest on grace. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I, <laughs> all right. So so I was I was gonna try to not go here tonight, but I don't have another choice. So 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 we we all know uh, that there's a, a biblical character in the Bible by the name of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now 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 God allowed something to be written by Paul in this book of Romans about Abraham that we've heard before, but I, we, we're going to get a different uh, revelation of it tonight. Uh, so in the fourth chapter, still teaching on by hope tonight, in the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, around about the 18th verse, the Bible says this concerning Abraham. The Bible says that Minister Black, yeah. who hoped against hope, mm -hmm. uh, okay, mm -hmm. uh, he still believed that God was going to do what God promised him, but he hoped against hope. So, so, Minister Wells, I began to look into what that really means to hope against hope. Okay, um, when it speaks of against hope, first thing to catch this, it meant literally, when it, the scripture is transcribed being this black, it literally means Abraham trusted even when every reason told him not to. Mm. Every reason, that, that's what that meant against hope, every reason, Minister Lipscomb, told him to quit. All right. Y'all know about him. He, he, he was 100 years old, but God promised him he was going to have a son. 
His wife is 90. So, so here's the thing that I, that I always find interesting. Even if he was strong, his wife was weak. But what happens when everything we depend on is weak? He, it's different if Abraham is 35 and she's 90. It's a little sick, but it's different. So it's different because there's still a glimmer of hope in the 35-year-old loins. But when the loins are 100 and the womb is 90, everything tells us we way past time. He had no grounds to stand on. But yet, hope told him hope. to still believe what God had promised. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, Minister Black, and I say this often when I talk about this story with Abraham. The interesting fact is not just that he had to hope God would do it. He had going for him that I already got a son in the earth. Mm -hmm. Because Ishmael is there. Ishmael, yeah. the, the, the non-promise, he's there. So it's easy to rest not just on his laurels, but he could even go back and say, well, God, you've already done it. Which he actually said to God. But yet God says there is something else I'm going to do for you that I need you to believe that I can still do. It. He says when every reason had passed him to believe, he still chose to believe. So tonight, the first point I want to give us in the lesson on by hope is that there is a progression of reason. I'm going to teach real good tonight. Okay, uh, there's a progression of reason. I'm telling you now, Abraham, according to what the Bible tells us in Romans 4, had no reason physically to believe that God would still do the thing that he promised him. But when hope comes in, it causes reason to progress. I'm going to teach real good tonight. Oh, God, if you just stick with me, I promise it's going to make sense. Uh, Abraham, Abraham, who um, about somewhere between uh, 13 to 20 years prior to the time he's, uh, he's got this visitation from God with Isaac, he has this uh, unusual encounter with God out of Genesis, the 15th chapter. In Genesis, the 15th chapter, Abraham has just come off these victories against these kings, and he's done these things. God has made this promise to him. He's going to make him the father of many nations. The Bible says in 15th chapter 6, verse, that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But after which he believed God, Brashel, there then came an experience that he had that gave him, stick with me, a reason to hope. I'm teaching tonight on by, by hope. First point I'm giving is that there's a progression of hope. Okay, uh, Abraham, again, who about between 13 and 20 years prior to God coming to visit he and Sarah to give them Isaac, he has this encounter with God in Genesis, the 15th chapter. The Bible says after God and Abraham had a discussion in terms of Abraham's belief of God, the Lord told Abraham, now I need you to do something. Let's, let's, let's go look at it because I want y'all to see this because it's so powerful. I don't want you to miss it. Turn to Genesis 15. I'm going to get back to, I hope all this is connected. Genesis 15. I'm going to start at verse, at verse 6, Genesis 15. I'm going to show you something that happens here uh, between God and Abraham. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, the 15th chapter. Um, the sixth verse says, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. Seven says, and he said unto him, uh, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee a land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? God, how do I know you're going to give me these promises? And he said unto him, God told him, take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a tur turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took them, he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the vows, when the fowls, the vultures, came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. I'm going to read through 17, I'm going to give you understanding. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. 
And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the, uh, the Amorites is not yet full. Seventeen is where I'll stop. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Here's the understanding I want us to catch. God, in the progression of reason, he visited Abraham in an external way. He visited him in a way that he could see him. Well, Pastor, how do I see that? Well, the Bible says that after God made promise to Abraham that he was going to do these things, Abraham asked him for a sign. He says, Lord, I need something to be able to hold on to when the days get dark. I need something to be able to hold on to. I need a visual experience. I need an external experience with you that will give me something to hold on to during the days that I, my faith may grow weary. And God says, no problem, I want you to take these animals, as we, we told, talked about here. And he says, I want you to separate them. So what he literally did was he took a knife, a little gory, but he took a knife, and down the middle of every animal, with the exception of the pigeons and the birds, he's literally cut them in half. He put one half of the animal on his side, and he put another uh, half of the animal on the other side. The side he was on represented who he was. The other side was a sacrifice he was making in the behalf of God. Stick with the text. As he cuts these things out, we identify that between Abram and God, God's space, is an open valley filled with blood. Hmm. From where he has literally cut open every animal. And blood that has been shed from these animals now stands in between his sacrifice and God. Stick with me. As he's standing there in the midst of bloody sacrifice, God now comes and visits him externally. Hmm. Walk with me, please. God says, Abram, because you've tapped into what hope is going to look like, I'm going to come and visit you externally so you will have a point of reference when you're going through the challenges of your faith. The Bible says that after Abraham has allowed blood to be shed on the earth, as he's allowed these sacrifices to now be, the scripture says something that I find very interesting. Once the enemy was acknowledging Abraham's sacrifice, the Bible says vultures came and tried to eat it. I, I, I'm going to walk with you tonight a little hmm. bit. Whenever God does a thing with us externally, it gives the enemy an idea of what God is up to in our lives. Hmm. Help me today. This is why I'm trying to teach us tonight that by hope there is a progression of reason. God is trying to get us away from having to always have the external. Hmm. Help me tonight. Because having the external gives the vulture something to eat. Hmm. Help me right here, Jesus. Your, 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 your business, and, and every time you post about new clients, and every time you share about progression and growth, what you do is give the vulture something to eat. God says, I'm, I'm trying to progress us out of the reason of the external. Because as long as the external is present, yes, I'm pleased with the blood I see, but it also makes the enemy hungry. It draws attention to what you're doing. And Abram now, catch this, this pitch, while he's trying to hear from God to have something to hold on to in days to come, he can't even put his attention on God because he has to be busy fighting off those that's trying to take from him. You missed it. Then I'll come back and pick you up. He says, I need it to be that when you know my presence is here, it's not time for you to fight. But it's time for you to listen. <laughs> see, 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 oftentimes, mother, we come to church and, and, and the preacher, the teacher gives us the exact thing that we need. But instead of us listening, we're too busy fighting. We, we're fighting something that we think exists that isn't even there. I'm fighting somebody not liking me when that person doesn't even like themselves. Wow. How about that? Wow. He says, 
Abram now, Mr. Black, instead of being able to focus on the God that's visiting him, has to spend his time fighting off vultures. I don't know about anybody else in Singleton, but I've been in situations where I knew I should have been worshiping, but I was fighting. The presence of God has been high. He is there. He is near. He's nigh. We can touch him. We can feel him. But I'm too busy fighting up here. Wow. I'm thinking about what's next instead of worshiping while I'm in it. Mm. He says, hope comes. I've given you hope that you can progress away from reason. Help me today. You don't have to be like Gideon that's got to put 35 fleece out. And Lord, if the ground is dry and the fleece is wet, I'll know it's you. And the next day, Lord, if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, I'll know it's you. He says, I need us to graduate from having to always have the external. Hope, hope, hope. Yeah, I know it too, Black. He says, by, by, by hope, I'm causing there to be a pulling away. So now Abram, who has set a stage to see and to hear from God, has to now waste his time fighting the vultures that are trying to eat what God was supposed to be only for God. And the Bible says this, uh, Mr. Luscom, after God saw him fight the vultures, God did something to him. God put him in a place where he had to try to figure out whether he was going to sleep or be afraid. Mm. It's in the text. The Bible says that after which he's fought the vultures, God then sends to him a deep sleep. But he also, in the middle of that, falls into a deep horror. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I don't know about you, Sister Coop, but it's hard to sleep when you're scared. Mm -hmm. It's real. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so one of the two going to go lacking. Either sleep or fear. Mm -hmm. I, I can't live Preachers. in both of them. Right. Preacher, stay right there. I will. He said, he said that, that's why our hope is so little. Because instead of sleeping, we're still fearing. Mm. Yeah. Now, now catch this, Sister Kanisha. This is what I love. The Bible tells me. I, let me read it to you so you don't think I'm making it up. The, the scripture says, uh, verse 12, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abel, and lo, a great horror of darkness fell upon him. Now, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, Black, yeah. if God is the one orchestrating this. Mm. Uh, if God is the one orchestrating this, why would God allow horror to enter in his presence? Because the Bible, we read it and we quote it. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. How could God allow horror when he told me he didn't give the spirit to me? You know what I begin to think and realize, Mr. Black? Is that the only reason horror existed is because Abraham fed it. Because horror will never exist in the presence of God. That's good. I've either got to excuse God so I can be afraid That's right. or excuse fear so God can be present. That's right. That's right. Abraham had to make a choice. Yeah. Do I stay afraid? Wow. Or do I rest in the fact that God is controlling all of this? I'm talking to somebody tonight that's still missing sleep. He says this is a time for you to rest. Your horror only pushes God's presence away. Yeah. Well, pastor, ain't scared. Yes, you are. Because fear doesn't always look like what you think it is. Oh. You might not be scared from the standpoint of a spider coming to crawl on you. But there's some fear as it relates to apprehension of you going forward in something you know God has called you to do. There's a fear of you going to buy a house because you're not sure you're going to be able to make the home payment. There's a fear of you applying for a new job because you feel like your education is limited and you won't get it. Help us. So we all walk in measures of fear. But God says when I'm present, fear and me can't coexist. Yes, sir. That's it. So every time I feed my fear, That's right. I push God further from where he wants to be. And all of this came because I needed an external sign. All of the fear and the imbalance in my life comes because I'm not settled with the fact that God already spoke it. I need to come back to the altar again. Oh, yeah. God, help yeah. me, help yeah. me, help me. He says, some of this, Abraham... We wouldn't even have had to gone through had you just been able to rest in the fact that I told you you was going to have a son. But because he had to see something, he asked the question, God, how am I going to know 
that this is going to happen. God says, I don't think you really want to go there. <laughs> Abraham, yes, God, I need to know. I see you hand digging. Yes, I need to know. How is this going to happen? God says, well, now I got to allow you to be in a place where you got to figure out whether to trust me or to be afraid. Mm. Yeah. If you would have just rolled with me when the prophetic word was given in verse 1 that said, I am your exceeding great reward on, and your you. shield. Come on. If you would have just rested in verse 1, we never have to have verse 16. Oh, my. Because it already would have been established when it was shared the first time. Deacon Bartman. I'm with you. He said that when you when you ask for the physical proof mm -hmm. and you remove that piece of faith, you also you're gonna do either one of two things. You're either gonna reduce the blessing that you're receiving in, mm -hmm. or you're gonna prolong how long that it takes you to get there. That's it. Because I need to see it so much, okay, well, I can't give you as much as I wanted to because I already gave you a piece of it before you got it. Or I got to keep you in it longer for you to realize it wasn't because I showed you a piece. It was still because I did it. <laughs> oh, God, from Zion. So sometimes my preview causes prolonging of my process. Oh, that's good. Work with those peas right there. My preview sometimes causes prolonging of my process. That's good. That when I'm so busy asking God, let me see the inside of it before I get the keys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, well, now I got to delay you getting the keys yeah. because you already got a sneak peek of what the blessing going to look like when you're supposed to live in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so he says, hope comes to remove the external reasoning. I'm trying to get you away from that. I, I don't want you to have to look for the sign. I just want you to be able to trust me. So the Bible says Abraham. <laughs> it, it now really interests me, Minister Black, because uh, Deacon Evans, you know, we just said in Romans 4, 18, which is a parallel to this story in Genesis 15, we said Abraham hoped against hope. Mm -hmm. Well, Pastor told me that when, that when it was written like that, that meant that he didn't have a reason to believe. What you just told me, Pastor, in Genesis 15, he had a reason. Mm -hmm. So what happened, Pastor, between the writing of Genesis and the writing of Romans? And I'm going to give you one thing that's going to bless your heart and maybe give you a little more freedom about where you are. Life happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has ever experienced this before, <laughs> but there are some times you can have a knockdown, drag out Sunday with God. I mean, one of the Sundays that God met you so well that all you could do was sleep when you yes. got home. Mm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, but, but then Monday shows up. <laughs> and there is such a smack in the face yeah. of reality. My, my, my bank account is overdrawn. My, you know, my, my husband is acting crazy. My boss is weird. I, I was in an accident. Oh. All of this. Jesus, what? What happened to what you showed me yesterday? Life. Somebody say life. 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 So Abraham now has 15, somewhere between 13 to 20 years of life to show up every day. It didn't stop. It didn't slow down. It actually intensified. Why? Because the vultures were aware of what God was trying to do. We celebrate promotion. That's a good thing to do. But understand that promotion also comes with vultures. Yeah, we, we, we celebrate promotion in the kingdom. We celebrate promotion in the, in, the, in the secular. We celebrate promotion, but with promotion comes some vultures. Mm -hmm. Some folks that God has anointed you to fight. Mm -hmm. Not pray for them. <laughs> oh, my. He anointed you to fight them. Ooh, preach, wait, see that. I just told you the text. When the enemy came, Abraham ain't say, please don't touch this. Mm -hmm. He didn't say in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. There it is. Right. He didn't say, don't you know this is dedicated to God? He realized that the only way you're going to get a vulture off your back wow. is to punch him in his face. Mm, mm, mm. Pastor, are you instructing me to fight people? No. I'm instructing you to understand that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, yes. but mighty through God. There are some things you're going to have to do. I said this on Sunday. You're going to have to do some things differently to fight an enemy. Yes, sir. 
Some fights you got to throw sand in people's eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just too big to try to fight straight up. I just can't do it. I got to do something to bring you to my level. I got to get these knees. I got to do something. But I got to find a brick. Something has to happen. In order for me to be victorious, unless I can call Cooper, I got to do something to change the game. Yes, sir. <laughs> But I got to do something different, man. I can't just go head up with this one. Yeah, I got, I got to bring you down. So the Bible says, Abram, he's fought these things on. He has this experience with God. God now shows up in that same chapter, the same section of scripture. God shows up. The Bible says that there was a fire that came and walked through the middle of the sacrifice. This fire was indicative of the presence of God. That God literally shows up. When Abraham was balancing whether to be scared or sleepy, God shows up and walks through the sacrifice. Yeah. And as he's walking through the sacrifice, Minister Black, he says, Abram, I'm going to do what I said. From that moment, Abraham had an external reason. He goes home. When he goes home, if you continue to read the text in the 16th chapter, he's welcomed with Sarah saying, hey, I can't have no babies. Now, um, they've been married for a number of years at this particular point. Abraham is very much aware that she can't have any babies. Why do you come to me today? I just left the presence of God. My God. I, I, I just walked out of the smoke. You can still smell God on me. And the first thing you say is not hello. You say, I can't have no babies. So now Abram is battling, do I listen to what God had just told me a verse ago? Or do I put weight on this crazy woman that's supposed to be one with me? And the script, <laughs> she was a vulture. She came to fight the blessing. Abram says, well, Sarah, which one we do about that? I mean... I'm not God. You know, I just had a, a real experience with him. How about this? What if we try right now? Right now. Why you can still smell him on me. Go ahead. Why the anointing is still flowing. Why don't we try right now? But instead, catch this, he takes that seed to another woman. So now, whereas they have both been negative for 10 years, in one day, Negative turned positive because God had just anointed him to bring a seed to the earth. Mm. Wow. <laughs> had he at that moment said, I just had a visitation from God and I believe things have changed. Yeah. At that moment, th there's hope. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Because I just had a moment with God where he reminded me of what he was yes, going to do through me. And for you to speak to me about a baby must be a sign that it's time for us to have one. Mm. But instead, he goes unto her handmaid. The Bible says Ishmael is now birthed. He's 86 years old. Next 13 years pass in his life, he's not even thinking about his experience with God anymore because he's had 13 years worth of days that have been filled with uh, Sarah and Hagar getting at each other, with Ishmael getting on his nerves, with servants not acting right, all these things that are going on, and now God comes back to him and says, do you remember what I promised you? 18th chapter of Genesis, he says, do you remember what I promised you? Abraham says, well, Lord, you already fulfilled that promise. Uh, don't you hear Ishmael running around here? He's 13 now. Uh, we're setting him up to be a king. We, we're setting him up to be the prince that God, that you called him to be. Abraham said, no, he's not it. Uh, I promised you I was going to do this through Sarah. Well, Lord, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, I mean, oh, that's the same in our custom. You know, we already got, no, I promised you I was going to do it through her. Abraham now says, well, God, I'm 99 years old. Um, ain't no reason for me even to believe. At 99 and she 89, that nothing is jumping. It's, it's, no re it's no reason. My reason is gone. God doesn't even go back through the process of what he did for him. But God just says, now, Abram, I'm requiring you to hope beyond what you've seen. Mm -hmm. Now to hope connected to what you know. Mm -hmm. 
the progress of reasoning is that God takes the sign from external to internal. Abram now has to believe that God is going to do with him what God promised 13 years ago. He has to believe that God is going to now perform connected to what he said. But there's something that still occurs, and I'm going to get off Abraham, but there's something that still occurs in the midst of this. The Bible says that the one he's supposed to connect with, this wife Sarah, when she hears what God says, she starts laughing. Preacher, what are you trying to teach me tonight? Sometimes when God has called you to another level of hope, those closest to you will laugh at your testimony. Mm. The ones that love you the most are the ones that will attempt to dissuade you from going back to that church. Mm. Are the ones that will attempt to dissuade you to say, you too young to do that right now. The ones that really should be in your corner, Sarah, the ones that you're actually going to bless when you get it mm -hmm. are the ones that laughed at you. Story progresses, we know they end up having the, 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 the son. Now, the progression of hope going from external to internal, God gave me an, an additional thought. I'm, I'm, I'm done with Abraham for tonight. Um, he gave me an additional thought connected to the man Paul who wrote this particular text in Romans 8, which says that, you know, we are saved by hope. Um, there, there's a story in the 20, well, it starts in the 25th chapter of Acts, and it runs through the end of the 26th chapter, where Paul has now been imprisoned. Um, and connected to him being imprisoned, uh, he was imprisoned firstly by a man by the name of Felix. And Felix, even though he was the uh, pro-counselor of that particular time in, in Jerusalem, um, he was also a, shy, a shyster. And Felix wanted to make a few dollars off of Paul. So the Bible says that in a time when it came for him to end his reign and his successor Festus came to take his place, Scripture says that he let all the other prisoners go, but he held Paul in prison because he thought the Jews were going to give him some money for doing it. Mm. The Bible says that Festus now hears of Paul being in prison. He begins to ask questions. Why is this man in prison? Well, this one day, a man by the name of King Agrippa, he comes to visit Festus, the new proconsular. And when he's there, he's talking to uh, Festus, and Festus makes mention of Paul to him. King Agrippa says, well, I want to hear from him myself. I want to hear from this man myself that, that y'all are condemning, because um, it doesn't sound like he's done anything wrong. Scripture says in the 26th chapter, 26th chapter of Acts that Paul now comes to stand before King Agrippa. As he's standing there before King Agrippa, I want you to catch him. Did you know hope? Paul says something. He says, you know, I used to be messed up. I, I was one of the ones that persecuted the church. I would kill Christians. I made people that were saved do things wrong. Uh, I was jacked up. He says, but I, I came to an understanding of who Jesus is. And when I came to that understanding, there was a hope that was birthed in me. Mm. He says, it's because of the hope that I have that I'm in bonds today. Mm -hmm. I want you to stick with me on by hope. Uh, so, some, sometimes hope will get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me sit right there for a minute. Um, Paul says it's, it's not because of anything other than what I believe, that I'm being ostracized in the city. It's only because I hope the way I do that I'm now in these bonds. He says, I've been accused of things I did not do because I hope in the Lord. Stick with me on this black. He says, sometimes your hope will make people lie on you. Yeah. Paul says, I haven't, I haven't done anything wrong. King Agrippa, I'll run my whole story to you, Minister Williamson. And he runs down the story of how he meets Jesus. And as he's telling this story, Agrippa is looking like, oh, this is amazing. I, how, why is this man in bonds? So much so that Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. You, you, your, your, your words were so impactful that you almost caused some things to shift in my life mm. based on the hope that you have. Mm. So preach, what are you telling me? Sometimes my hope, even though it gets me in trouble, it will lead me to people who may never hear about Jesus otherwise. Yeah. 
That's right. Trying to help you that even in 2019, there are people who have not heard about Jesus. Pastor, I don't think that's true. Well, it's got to be because the earth is still spinning. That's right. <clears throat> if, if everybody has heard about him, then I'm in heaven already. Because the Bible says that heaven and earth won't pass until everything the word, the word of the Lord has been fulfilled. Everybody has to come into knowledge of who Jesus is before this earth shuts down. Before he sends Jesus back, the world has to have known about the Savior. Yes, sir. So sometimes Lipscomb, God puts us in place where he sends us to Mexico. And we think we've gone because of our job. Uh -oh. But he really sent us to meet an Agrippa. Mm. That, that, that name, Agrippa, hmm, it literally means difficult one. Mm. <laughs> Listen to what Hope did. Hope calls the difficult one to say, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. <laughs> Everybody, don't, you know, just don't say the name out loud, but think about it. <laughs> The difficult people in your life. Uh-huh. Yeah, you got them. Yeah. He says your hope has the ability to make the difficult people in your life change for the better. Your hope. <laughs> your hope. Your hope. The, the, the fact that Bump Night, you still holding on to what God has promised can make difficult people change their mind. Oh, God, help me here. He, he says, so, so what I'm realizing, uh, Deacon Moss, is that my, my hope and my faith are always on trial. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's always, a seven days, a reason, oh God help me, it's always a reason for me to believe even when I can't see it external. Mm. I told you that, that reason, hope comes to make reason progress from the external to the internal. Well, Paul put it this way as he was writing a scripture in Colossians 1st chapter 27th verse he says this is Christ in you the hope of glory which means what we realize or what we know and what we learn is that the hope that now rests in us is Christ stick with me please the hope that rests in us is Christ which means I don't need external reasoning anymore because I have the internal reason living in me Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That means he has put himself in me that when I could not find a reason to still believe, he finds it for me. This is why I can't throw in the towel on any promise he's made because in the moments that I would quit, Christ in me believes for me. Awesome. That's, That's awesome. why the man says, thinking as well. Jesus is dealing with she said it. He's dealing with his son. He brought the son to the disciples in the 17th chapter of Matthew. He brought the son to the disciples. The disciples couldn't heal the boy. He says, Lord, what in the world? How long I got to be with y'all? The Bible says the man begins to cry out to Jesus. Jesus, I need you to help my son. He says, I'll do whatever you want me to do if you believe. He says, Lord, I believe. Just help my unbelief. Yeah. Help the parts of me that still struggle yeah. with reasoning. Yeah. Help the parts of me that still wants to trust you, but I see my money. Yeah. The parts of me that wants to trust you, but I see the tubes in the person I'm praying for. Yeah. The parts of me that want to trust you, but the shambles I'm experiencing in my marriage are real. Yeah. He says, help yeah. my unbelief. Yeah. We've got something that that man didn't have. We've got Jesus through the Holy Ghost yes. living on the inside of yes. us. So now when I make that statement to help my unbelief, what happens is I kill myself. Yes. And the Christ in me stands up. Wow. And he says, you just called for me. Mm -hmm. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> so when, when, the, when depression comes and wrecks my mind, cool, all I got to do is say, help my unbelief. And Jesus shows up and says, Coop, what do you need me to do for you? Jesus. I'm here for you. Hope won't make you ashamed. God help me here. Gracious. He says in Romans, all I got is Bible. He says in Romans 5, that fifth verse, and hope maketh not ashamed. 
because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Which means that when I have Jesus in me, the hope of glory, there now is an undying belief that even when the best of me doesn't believe mm -hmm. and the worst of me tries to become present, mm -hmm. the hope of glory in me yes. makes me snap out of it. Mm. Preacher, <laughs> what, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is if we're living in disbelief, we need to check our salvation. Oh, God, help me hear Jesus. If I'm living in disbelief, I'm not saying that if disbelief comes to visit you because it visits all of us. But it definitely can't stay. When the hope of glory is in me, D, that means the greater one is working through me. He says that external to internal reasoning, the reasoning shifts. Abraham, just like uh, that man that we talked about <clears throat> in the Gospels where he asked for the Lord to help his unbelief. Abraham, even though he was a great patriarch, even though he was a great man of God, he still did not have what we have. Preacher, what are you talking about? Well, Old Testament believers didn't have the same access that we've got. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Even though he was the father of faith, even though he hoped against hope, he's believed God when nobody else would. He did not have working in him what we have working in us. Yeah. We got a, hand, a head up, a hand up, and a whatever else up over all of the Old Testament saints. Because we have inside of us yes. the hope of glory. Yes. Which means, catch this, heaven lives in me. Yes. But it only lives in me by hope. I got to believe beyond what I see. Hope does that for me. Now, so, 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 so there's a progression. There's a progression of reasoning. Okay, uh, Paul, Paul, he wrote, he says, you know, that we're saved by hope. So, so when, when I looked at that, going, going back to Romans 8, when he says we're saved by hope, verse 24, he says uh, that, that word, that word saved in the Greek is the word sozo. Sozo is S-O-Z-O. Sozo. Sozo in the Greek, it means delivered. It also means protected. This is one I like. It means healed. It means preserved, and finally it means made whole. He says, for we are saved, we are delivered, protected, healed, preserved, made whole by hope. Uh-huh. Sozo, S-O-Z-O. Yes, S-O-Z-O. Sozo, Sozo. He says we're delivered, protected, healed, preserved, and made whole by hope. Preacher, what does that mean? That means in every area of my life, hope works for me. Okay. Um, financial, hope works for me. Spiritual, hope works for me. Physical, hope works for me. Pastor, are you just teaching, you know, just pipe dreams and nothing? No, 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 no. I I'm teaching that there is something inside of me that causes me to know that everything is going to be all right. That's it. Oh, God, Black, I wish I had some help right there. L listen to this. He says, Dean is Black, everything is going to be all right. That's it. Because of what's in you. That's right. Not because of what you're dealing with. Not because you go to church or don't go to church, but because you've made Jesus your choice. There is now a hope working in you that Bro Wooders, even when you can't see it, is working for you. This is why when we go through, I start like this, when we go through challenges, this is why we don't just resort to peel bottles. Because I've got to allow what's in me to work for me. Before I go to pop the bottle, whether that's peel or alcohol, you'll catch that next week. Before I go pop the bottle, have I cried out to what's already in me? Have I talked to the power in me to work for me in this situation? That's just like somebody, I see Handy's ball tonight. That's just like somebody 
who know they've been paying their power bill, all these things, to walk into a dark room and sit down and just cry. Mm. <laughs> just go to the switch and turn on the lights. That's right. But that's, that's what we do. We know we didn't pay our spiritual power bill because we got saved. But when the issue of darkness comes, we sit on the bed and cry. Mm. Just go turn on the switch. Mm. You got access. Yes, sir. The light will come on. Yes, you will have an aha moment. Yes. You'll start saying, you know what? It's not even as bad as I thought it was. Mm. But I just do this, this, and this. Then I ain't got to work. So in the morning, I'm going to make a phone call to this person, that person, and everything will be all right. Let me get Bulk Night Pits demos. I love it. Yes! Yes! <laughs> y'all, you know, Bulk Night, y'all get a star tonight for remembering some of them old, <laughs> them old sermons. Y'all been with me a long time. I look at Jesus. If it's not over, it's all A L L right. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Pits, please. So when you first started, you said what makes us as Christians different from everybody else cope. So when we're in a position where we're trying to encourage people that don't hmm. claim to be Christian, how, what does that conversation, I guess, look like? Because if I'm encouraging my sister who's sitting right beside me, oh, remember Pastor said, blah, 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 it's a lot easier conversation. But somebody that doesn't have that relationship, how do you give hope to somebody that doesn't have? I love it. Th th this is how I lead you to hope. I lead you to the hope I have. It's no need. So, so I'm gonna give you a practical example to exactly what you said. So, if if and this is just true, okay? Somebody say this is true. This is true. Okay. So, if a homosexual couple were to come to me and ask for marital advice, it's no way I can counsel you because what I believe or where my counsel comes from is connected to what I believe. I'm gonna counsel you. If you're a man loving a woman, I can't counsel a man trying to love another man because I don't believe in that way. So my conversation is no disrespect, but anything I would share with you would mirror what my beliefs are. I don't believe what you're doing is right. So I don't have wisdom to give you. I can pray with you mm -hmm. that you make an adjustment to where I can give you wisdom. But apart from that, I can't give you wisdom on that level. I can give you personal wisdom because you're still a person. I can give you financial counsel. I can give you even emotional counsel. But I can't give you marital counsel because everything I'm going to say connects to what I believe. In that same instance, if somebody I know is not saved and they're going through something and depression that's real visits them, I'm going to attempt to share with them how I know I can overcome depression by inviting Jesus into your life. Mm -hmm. And how you okay? That's it. So, so, so if, we, if, we, if we heard the message on Sunday, that's one of the things I was saying, that this is a season in these manifestations of the great things that God's going to do. We can't be ashamed of our testimony. That's it. Because your testimony is what's going to help deliver somebody. Yeah. Look, that's it. I was a, I, I'm just, it was, this wasn't me, but I'm giving an example. Yeah. You know, uh, I was a just, you know, fall out drunk. Yeah. Oh. I was weeble wobble. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, you know, yeah, I was 80 proof. <laughs> All the time. But when I allowed Jesus into my heart, yes. and he began to speak to who I was, mm -hmm. and it helped me to realize I was better than this, I had a hope then. That's it. That made me not have to depend on that bottle no more. But without Jesus being in you, you can't have the same access wow. to that hope. Because you got to be in him. I got most, and I'm going to come to you, Thompson. Um, this message is really helping me. Uh, today, when I was at work, uh, the Lord dropped in my spirit. You have it in you. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about until tonight. <laughs> and then he dropped in my spirit again tonight. You know, you're talking about that hope yes, that sir. is in us. He said, we have hope on demand. Yeah. Um, meaning when I need it, it's already there. You got to tap into it, most. But the problem is, some of us have too much stuff on our 
Yeah, it's full. Can't get to it. Yeah. So we gotta try to scatter some of that stuff out. Yeah. Because we have hope on the man. Yeah. That's it, folks. That's it, folks. But we got a million programs. This this junk that just saved in the space where hope needs to be. The first thing I pull up is junk. I pull fear up. I pull depression up. I pull calling my wrong friends up. Anxiety. I pull it up. All I got to do is just filter through some of that foolishness and find the folder called hope. And every episode is right there for you. Every season. Mm. Hallelujah. Hope. That's good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thompson. I was just going to say you oh were like the same thing as what uh, Sister Ma said. Because of, of the hope, once we realize and know that we have the hope on the inside, yes. God is going to give us what we need to help that person, that unsafe person. Yes. As far as like trying to get them to come to realize who he is. That's it. This is more about our hope within. That's it. And that's what he does. He gives me what to say. So I was going to give you that one. So that's a good segue for me, Thompson. So that's a, in Luke, the 12th chapter, Dr. Butler, I gave you this word probably one of the first times I met you. Luke chapter 12, the 11th and the 12th verse, Jesus says this. I'm paraphrasing it. He says, when they bring you before the counselors and the synagogues and the priests, he said, take no thought what you should say when you stand before them, because the Holy Ghost who's in you in that same hour will give you what you ought to say. Mm -hmm. That's right. When I've got hope in me, he will show up in the hour mm -hmm. when I access him. Yes. That's where we fail, Coop. We don't want to tap into him. This is why. Because specifically where we are in our walk, Sister Kira, we, we may say, well, I'm young, and I don't want to sound all churchy when I talk to people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound all deep. Yeah, you're not sounding deep. You better start listening to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> He'll talk to you in your own vernacular. Yeah, he'll allow you to speak to them in the ways you speak, but it'll be him. I don't want to, you know, it's going to sound like I'm all deep. No, that's the Holy Ghost trying to give you some insight into how to answer every man. That's it. We pray that every morning we're supposed to be anyway. Hallelujah. God. All right. Did I see another hand? Because I, okay, okay. Bought night, then we'll go back to Thompson. Yes, sir. Could you give me some clarity on the delineation between faith and hope? Yeah. What? Fault night? I want to tackle you, man. <laughs> so, so, so listen. So, so this, oh God. So, so, so the Bible says. Let's listen to this fault night, and it's so familiar. And when you hear it, you will say, "Die, Pastor. I knew that." Hebrews eleven one. Now faith mm -hmm. is so, the substance so. of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is literally the tangible hope that we can't see. That's it. My getting up knowing that, you know, I, I, use, I use the example I like to use sometimes. When we came in today, you know, we didn't check our seat. We didn't shake it, look under it, make sure all the screws were tacked in. We just sat down. Because faith told me hope is going to hold me. Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, faith told me. What I'm looking at is going to hold me. Same thing with where we are in our walk with God. That if I want to experience the tangible side of hope, just walk in faith. That when I get up and do by faith, I'm going to end up seeing the hope that I'm looking for. Because God, even greater than these chairs, will never change. When, when we first got the building and we set these chairs up and you all in your own way kind of chose your, your seats, you'll catch that next week. Um, <laughs> so everybody knows elder seat. Uh, sidebar, so I was talking, we were talking about a little uh, coordination how we were going to do things. And I was sharing with some of my leaders how I wanted the people to sit. And I was named, and so Mr. Ware said, oh, yeah, Elder just going to sit in his seat. <laughs> I said, well, it's not really his seat, but I feel what you're saying. <laughs> so, 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 so the point I'm making is, when we chose our seat, almost two years ago, when we chose our seat, 
every week when we come in, yeah. we looking for our seat. Yeah. If somebody's in our seat, we in our feelings. Yeah. Now, we ain't going to fight and act up because we still saved. But I'm in my feelings a little bit because you know that's my seat. Right? <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you, you know. Come on, man. And then if it's your man that's in your seat, you will go to him at the church and say, come on, man. You know that's my seat, though, man. Yeah. Well, that's how hope's supposed to look. Stick with me, preacher. That when God has made me a promise, I'm not going to let nobody alter my promise. I'm not going to let nobody discourage my promise. Or take my promise. Mm. And I'm going to check them if they try to check me on my promise. Because mm. this belongs to me. Mm. You ain't going to sit in my seat. Yes, sir. And I love you. <laughs> but that's where my hope is. Oh, God. So Sister Simonet says something. And I saw your hands at times. Sister Simonet said, and I'm really close. It's 8.07. I ain't going to be here much long. Sister Simonet said something. Um, Minister Black was teaching Sunday school, I believe, some a month or so ago. He said something about her changing her seat. Um, you know, just doing something different today, changing her seat. And she, you know, she said, Pastor, I listened to him and I changed my seat. I'm like, wow, it was so much better when I changed my seat. Now, catch this. Now, the seat was a closer seat. She said, I can see the difference when I was willing to simply move up. To a closer seat. Mm -hmm. Not to take nobody else's seat. But to move up. Where there was a seat available. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm at a funeral earlier today. And it's extremely packed in the funeral. And um, things aren't really working. In terms of the visuals. They were supposed to be able to send the video feed. To the overflow. And that didn't quite work. And so it was probably. And I'm not exaggerating. It was probably 500 people in the overflow. And um you know, he comes in and he shares with us that um, the video stream does not work. He apologizes. There's nothing we can do. And so I'm, I'm standing there and I said, well, I'm going to just wait for a minute. Dean is black and I'm going to just see how this, this all pans out. And uh, so at least 450 other people decided they were going to leave <laughs> because they heard that the stream wasn't going to work. And so and it's just cool. I'm, I'm serious. I, I really mean what I'm saying. Like. And I don't want to sound weird, but God wouldn't let me leave. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, God, this, this is weird. I mean, I, I'm, I'm having a conversation with him, so I probably look a little crazy to people. Because I'm like, um, but this is weird. Um, why can't I go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's already said that the stream is not going to work. What am I still hoping for? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what I was going to teach at that point. That's the exciting part. God, what, why, you know, I'm literally like, Lord, you got me here hoping for no reason. So, so I'm, I'm now saying, because hope is in me, I say, okay, God, if you're going to let me leave, at least show me why I'm supposed to be here. So I'm, I'm really, bro, Woodridge, looking for a reason as to why I just can't go. So I get up and I walk down the hall. And I look over, and I see that the sanctuary is, is right there. And at this point, the sanctuary is now accessible. Now, it was jam-packed, all these things earlier, but when people left because hope was gone, it opened up for me to be able to fulfill my purpose for being there. I said, the Lord, talk to me about what you just showed me. He says, hey, I want you to let the people to know tonight he says, sometimes they're in the right place, just in the wrong area. Because had I stayed in the room where the stream wasn't going to work, hoping that things were going to happen, because it's hope in me, God, I'm going to stay right here. He said, tell the people tonight, sometimes they have to change their position without leaving the area. Mm. I said, God, you, you, you're telling me something right here. He says, yes, I, I am that had you stayed in that room, still hoping for something to happen that I already told you wasn't going to happen, but the hope in you knew I had you there for a reason, had you not stayed, you would have missed what I was trying to show you. 
He says, but when you were willing to change your position without leaving the area, you were able to now see the reason that the hope was, at, was, was active in your life. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Sometimes it's not all the time. It's not that God isn't doing what he promised. Okay. He's just doing it in a different position. Mm -hmm. Stay with me on this, please. If God promised you anything and your hope won't let you leave, just like my hope wouldn't let me leave from out of this funeral. Mm -hmm. He says your sensitivity to go to another place in the same, another uh, position in the same area allowed me to be able to receive fulfillment about the thing I had hope for. So he told me, that's why he said in the scripture tonight, hope never makes you ashamed. So when I'm holding on to hope, Deacon is bought night, if I don't see it happening in the place where I know he told me, well, just don't leave the place, just change your position. Practical example. Don't leave this church when you heard the word here Maybe you need to change your attendance patterns. Mm. Hope, hope is a choice. Yes, sir. It's good. Mm. It's not that he changed his mind. Your position just off. I can't get what I want to get from God just being a Sunday morning only person. Mm. Let, let me get Thompson. Let me get Moss. And then we get Bob Knight. Thompson. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Different way. That's it. So if I'm changing the way I'm receiving it, and no, a pastor ain't telling me this to hurt me, but he's telling me this to help me, and I can receive it, Thompson. The one that just said it, hallelujah. The pastor ain't telling me this to hurt me, but to help me. When he tell me leave certain people alone, and I still don't leave them alone, and he come back and tell me he ain't going to tell me that no more, it's not that he said that because he don't love me. He said that because he's trying to help me understand that I got to leave certain people alone. <laughs> I'm praying for you, Jake. Um, most. You were saying about how you had to change Position. Yes. I'm reminded back in the day when I used to have satellite service. Mm -hmm. And my satellite faces a certain way. Mm -hmm. But when a storm comes, it is probably on, on the screen you might have to reposition. Yes. To get a better signal. Yeah. You don't move your dish from your roof. Right. You have to reposition. That's it, most. Just to get a better picture. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get rid of the service. No. 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 <laughs> yeah! You don't get rid of the service. You just got to change position. And here's the thing, most They say contact a professional to go change it. Because if you don't get up there and try to change it, you will mess something and you up. Oh, God. That's good, Moss. Bolt night. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yes. Right? Wrong direction. Readjust yourself, man. And I think that's a word all of us can take tonight. Sometimes I just got to be willing to readjust or reposition. It's not that you're in the wrong place, especially if it's got anything to do with church. You're in the right place. Don't get no better by his grace. But just reposition yourself. Just readjust. You ain't got to think about, well, I'm thinking about leaving the church. No. Maybe I need to think about repositioning myself. Maybe I need to change my seat when I come in. Because there's too much commotion in the back. Mm. <laughs> or maybe I need to actually come in the sanctuary and not just watch from the overflow. Mm. Maybe I need to be a part of the fellowship. Maybe I need to get here a little earlier so I can have praise and worship. And prayer. <laughs> you had something else. Yeah, very simple. Um, Hope is a choice. Yes. Yeah, it's a choice. Yeah, you can choose hope. Yes, sir. That's it, man. Mm -hmm. Because it's in me. Yeah. We can choose it. 
That's what I want us to catch tonight. As I, and I'm closed. You saw I closed my Bible, so I'm finished. But as that's that's what the by faith is, y'all. When we choose by hope, when we choose hope, and I'm choosing today that I'm not gonna be discouraged by what I've seen. I'm not gonna let the 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 you know the facts determine my truth. You know, I'm going to still choose to hope. I'm going to hope until there ain't nothing else left for me to hope in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm still going to hope. Yeah. Because uh, I know he did it for whatever reason. Yes, sir. But I got to choose. I got to choose. Hope. Bye. So come on, put your hands together. Thank you for tuning in to today's message. We pray that something was shared that would help you along your Christian journey. We realize that not everyone will be able to make it into the house of God here but we do know the importance of expanding the kingdom beyond the walls. And so we understanding that not everyone is connected to the body of Christ. We're asking today that if you desire just to let Jesus in your heart, pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, please forgive me. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead just for me. If you pray that simple prayer, you're now a part of the kingdom of God. We also understand that there are those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus in the past, but find ourselves in a backslidden condition. The Bible teaches us that God himself is married to the backslider. And because he's married to us, he's always welcoming us back with open arms. Pray this simple prayer with me today. Lord, please forgive me for any sin that I may have committed. Renew me, restore me, bring me back into right relationship with you. In Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, you've just been restored. We understand that it is important to chronicle our spiritual journey. So we would ask if you would, please just leave us a message. Let us know of the spiritual decision you made today that we can keep you in prayer and walk with you along your path. We thank God for you. We love you. And until next time, be blessed.